Hello and welcome to Showcase, Tier 2 World's flagship arts and culture show coming to you from our studio in Istanbul. On today's show, we'll explore the works of Viennese expressionist Oskar Kokoschka and pay a visit to Rome where Michelangelo's life is being given a musical twist. But first, Turkish art is getting more and more globalized. This fair plays a role in this. Art Ankara takes over Turkey's capital as the fourth edition of the International Art Fair kicks off. And all too human, Francis Bacon and Lucian Freud hang side by side to illustrate post-war trauma. London's Tate Britain is presenting a new multi-artist exhibition focusing on the human body and the sorrows it faces. Heavily influenced by the Second World War, the artworks are meant to illustrate humanity's own disillusionment with itself. Showcase's Nursana Tutar dropped by the show to see what the featured artists had to say. Harsh brush strokes and the colours of gloom fill the walls of Tate Britain. All Too Human exhibition reminds contemporary art lovers of the horrors of not so long ago. Existential philosophy had a huge impact on modernism. And here, around a hundred works by some of the most prominent British artists depict a human condition and suffering. The exhibition offers effectively a journey into one of the major and continuous developments into British art, looking across a century and looking at how important this sort of continuation of the way in which painters look at the intimate uh, subjects of their everyday life. We have uh, individuals who are normally friends, lovers, uh, members of one's family. We have group compositions that very much addresses one's position in the world, a painter's idea of human relationships relationships and the way in which we live together. So the exhibition is very much about the sense of the raw quality of the experience of being alive and what surrounds us. As well as Lucian Freud and Francis Bacon, artists like David Bomberg, Francis Newton Sousa, Stanley Spencer and Paolo Rego are uniquely side by side. It's very clever how they've curated this exhibition so that there's a pairing of artists within each room and there's a familiarity between either a friendship or the application of paint. And it's almost like reading a personal diary, but it's coloured paint on a canvas. Bacon and Freud gain special attention since some of the works by the two modern masters are rarely seen. Both examine the same subject, but with different approaches. I think there is a relationship certainly in the mood of the time. There was a sense of the impending doom of humanity. There was, you know, the end of the war, the uh, atomic bomb, this sense that one was really gripping on life uh, very tightly. So there is a sort of common backdrop to the practice. And yet, looking at Freud and Bacon, we can also look at the diversity in the which they engage with the figures. Uh, very importantly, Freud only always painted in the presence of the sitter and it's very much about the constant daily encounter and dialogue painting over and over again the same subject in the studio space. With Bacon he very much felt he couldn't paint in the presence of the subject because what he needed to do was something in a way aggressive and he couldn't quite paint in that way in the presence of the subject so he normally wore from photographs. Paolo Rego and other contemporary artists like Cecily Brown and Jenny Seville are showing that figurative painting is no longer a male-dominated field. It's very difficult in the art world to make it if you're not a man. But here we see the likes of Paula Rego, for example, has her own room and her own space here. And she is punching way above her height, showing how powerful a woman artist can be against all the odds where she's dealing with everyday life, with raising a family, with looking after a terminally ill husband. 
and I think she finds her comfort or her spa, if you like, or her joie de vivre in her palette. All Too Human, a century of painting life, aims to stir emotions and make the viewers leave the museum with a sense of oneness and inclusivity. Noor Sanatutar, TRT World, London. To speak more about the All Too Human Bacon Freud and a Century of Painting Life exhibition at the Tate Britain, I'm joined from London by art critic and writer Florence Hallett. Thank you so much for joining us today, Florence. Now, human suffering seems to be the main theme in the exhibit, but why was something as gloomy as that chosen as the focus? It's an exhibition that is um, really all about painters' experience of, of life and trying to get at the sensations, physical and emotional, psychological sensations of, of being human and what that means. And so, of course, um, suffering is a very central part of that. Bacon and Freud uh, would paint about very similar subjects, but tell me about their different approaches and styles. They do have very different approaches. And uh, while Bacon, uh, tends to, they, I mean, they both subject the human figure to um, an incredibly visceral and intense scrutiny. But in the case of um, Bacon, you know, the figure tends to disintegrate um, and distort before our eyes, whereas Freud's gaze is far more um, analytical um, and, and in some ways, Cool. Well, Florence, do you think that there was a statement being made in the art world by having the works of many contemporary women uh, artists on display at the exhibition? If you look at the um, general spread of the exhibition, it's incredibly male-dominated, and the inclusion of Paul Larego makes that incredibly evident. And then uh, towards the end of the exhibition, you're right, there are far more female artists represented. Um, I mean, I don't think it's just about trying to address the balance. Um, I think it is mostly because female artists working today have a particular um, investment in portraying the body in, and the experience of, of the female body. Well, Florence Hallett, thank you so much for speaking to us on Showcase today. Thank you, it's a pleasure. The Turkish capital of Ankara isn't well known for its thriving art scene, but that's something that could soon change. Art Ankara Fair is now underway, and as Showcase's Elif Bereketli reports, it's an event that's helping put the city on the international cultural map. A vibrant bus terminal featuring pink skies and explicit brush strokes. Hallucinatory stripes in overlapping layers. And a quirky young girl struggling to carry her luggage and ori body. These are all part of the Ankara Art Fair. For three days, the event will host hundreds of local and foreign galleries in this huge venue. 10,000 square meters, almost the size of two football pitches full of art. The fair takes place in the Turkish capital, but attendees have come from around the world. China is this year's guest of honor, but it's not the only East Asian country attending. And my words uh, is just to go outside and looking around and being in the nature and kind of, you know, thinking, being to be a one with the nature, okay? And then by using uh, Indian ink and Korean traditional paper, I just uh, started. If I made a mistake once, then I have to throw it away. I have to start from the first time, okay? That's a Korean traditional painting. Much Turkish art is being exhibited here too. 
Even though it's not possible to see younger artists' work, some eminent names from earlier generations are being showcased. My famous Istanbul paintings are being shown here, as well as this triptych and most excitingly, my new virtual reality work. It provides us with a tour in my Istanbul paintings. Most of these were showcased before. We have really good art events in Istanbul now. The art scene is not what it was like 50 years ago. I am always exhibiting somewhere. Despite having hundreds of galleries and museums, Turkey has only recently started playing host to dozens of art fairs, Art Ankara being one of the most recent. But what is the role of these fairs in the local art stage? Art fairs are for trade, but also for cultural exchanges. Culture cannot be without money, and money cannot be without culture. Turkish art world has been balancing that well. Progress in the last decades, especially the leap in the early 2010s, is incredible. So global terror and financial instability around the globe are said to have damaged the art business lately. Do you think this is also true for Turkish art scene? Of course, it is inevitable, but the drop in art business doesn't mean that the art scene is declining. Whatever happens in Turkey, art and creativity always find their way. The thing is, it is now time for other cities than Istanbul, for Anatolia to get a piece of the pie. And I am hoping Art Ankara will be a gateway to the rest of the country. Bringing together global with local and art with buyers, the fair proves Ankara is raising its game on the art stage. Elif Bereketli, TRT World, Ankara. Still to come on Showcase, celebrating a master of introspection. Politics, paintings and plays. Showcase's Miranda Addy introduces us to the illuminating life of Oscar Kokoschka. <laughs> Secrets of the Sistine. The making of Michelangelo's frescoed masterpiece is reimagined as a live musical performance in Rome. Can't be too careful these days. The world has gone bloody mad. I'll take two. Armed and ready, Lara Croft returns to the big screen, this time starring Alicia Vikander. <laughs> Gustav Klimt, Egon Schiele, Koloman Moser, Oscar Kokoschka. They're the four most important Viennese modernists, all of whom helped change the face of painting in Austria. Klimt, Schiele and Moser all died a century ago, but Oscar Kokoschka lived until 1980 and kept on working up to his death at the age of 94. We sent Miranda Addy to see some of that work, currently on display at Vienna's Leopold Museum. Vienna's a city known for its beautiful architecture, its museum's quarter, and its art. This year marks a century since some of Austria's most influential artists died, Egon Schiele, Koloman Moser, and of course, Gustav Klimt. All three are associated with starting a new movement, Viennese modernism. It was more abstract, more figurative, and more expressionist than classical Austrian art. Klimt, however, is probably the most well-known. Vienna's Art History Museum has always been home to 13 examples of his earlier work. But it's only the second time in its history that the full details of the paintings can be taken in. Normally, you have to see them from the staircase from 20 meters uh, distance. So we decided to make this bridge construction to be able to be more or less eye to eye with Gustav Klimt to see those uh, paintings. They are painted on canvas, not on the wall, not fresco, but canvas paintings, to see them in a distance at, at length uh, arm, so to say. At 27, Klimt was commissioned to decorate these spaces on the wall. He created his 13 paintings from different periods, Egypt to the Renaissance. 
he was perfect in his technique, but he wanted to transcend uh, historicism. He wanted to transcend um, historical art and wanted to do something modern, something new, combining different genres uh, of the arts, always on a very high level. Of course, uh, Gustav Klimt was very well aware of, of the art history, so he combined the best of what he had seen and really brought it into, really into, into a new style. A few years after creating these 13 paintings, Gustav Klimt became the president of Artist Association Secession. All started 120 years ago, 121 years actually, in 1897 when uh, Gustav Klimt and uh, his fellow artists, some of his friends, uh, decided that they don't want to be part of this other artist association anymore because they were deeply rooted in uh, historicism and much too conservative. It actually really was the birthplace of what we call nowadays Gesamtkunstwerk uh, because they decided that art should not only hanging galleries that art should also permeate everyday life. Klimt's legacy was more than just the paintings he left behind though. Secession altered the way people thought about art in Vienna, making it more accessible and bringing international artists to attention. The exhibition Vienna 1900 displays some of Klimt's most unusual works. Visitors are especially taken by death and life, with Thanos, or death, lurking over the shoulder of life. And the Mack Museum in Vienna is also celebrating Klimt by combining the old with the new. Nine of his cartoons from Stocklet House in Brussels have been reimagined via virtual reality. So this work that I've created is about going into Klimt's painting, but then going out the other end into a landscape, into a symbolic landscape that's inspired by the theme of waiting, of expectation. That's the first landscape you come to. And then at the end, coming to a moment of fulfillment. What's so unique here is that the Magic Garden is using the latest technology to bring Gustav Klimt, who's so rooted in Viennese modernism, firmly into present day, and using a pretty cool VR set to do it. Gustav Klimt's symbolism, figurative work and intricate decorative style is being celebrated at locations throughout Vienna for the entire centenary year since his death. Miranda Atti, TRT World, Vienna. Most of us are familiar with looking at Michelangelo's work, but a new production in Rome is letting us experience it as a live stage show. It's a collaboration between the Vatican Museum's singer-songwriter Sting and several producers who've staged Olympic opening ceremonies. The fully immersive experience tells us the story behind the painting of the Sistine Chapel and what drove Michelangelo to do it. The Sistine Chapel as never seen before. Vatican Museums, in collaboration with some of the top talents in music, theatre and video, have created a live show telling the tale of Michelangelo and his frescoed masterpiece. This is a powerful show, an intense show, a wonderful show, a show in which technology blends in with art, spirituality and history. It's something that wants to establish very strong emotional trajectories. The show, that took more than two years to put together, was created through the scientific advice of experts from the Vatican Museums. The main music theme was created and sung by musician Sting in Latin, while the Italian actor Pier Francesco Favino stars as the voice of Michelangelo. In tutto questo c'è in all of this, there's also the chance to tell a story that's very Italian. Sometimes as a Roman, I underestimate living here, and maybe also habit leads you to think that this is normal at all. In my opinion, everything that can bring attention to our artistic heritage, well, not only does it need to be done, but I'm also very happy to participate. Tu 
While providing an educational opportunity to bring art, culture and faith to younger audiences, the exhibition also shows that Michelangelo's work transcends the passage of time. He's the wonderful, universal artist. He's the one who always asks questions, and behind his stubbornness, agitation and torment, he's able to investigate a very deep humanity. We wanted to show what there is between the artist and his work. We want to show the spirit that exists between Michelangelo and his works of art. The show gives the audience a chance to see the Sistine Chapel in the closest way possible. The interpretation is also in this approach to the images, which is exactly the same that we technicians have when we're climbing the scaffolding to carry out restoration. Every January we do this job inside of the Sistine Chapel, and this show offers the same privileged point of view that we technicians have. This immersive experience enables us to see that Michelangelo's Last Judgment gives an extraordinary perspective on what it means to be human. It first came out as a video game before it reached worldwide popularity with an action-packed movie series starring Angelina Jolie. The Tomb Raider, a.k.a. Lara Croft, is back after 15 years. But this time, it's Oscar winner Alicia Vikander donning the distinctive tank top and holster strap as she sets out on a global adventure in the first reboot of the film series. What's your name? Lara. Surname? Croft. Lara Croft is the fiercely independent daughter of an eccentric adventurer who mysteriously disappeared when she was barely a teen. I see so much of him in you. Now, as a 21-year-old who's having a hard time moving on, she leaves everything she knows behind in search of her dad's last known destination. It will be an adventure. Death is not an adventure. The Tomb Raider reboot stars Alicia Vikander, the Swedish actor takes over the role of Lara Croft from Angelina Jolie, who starred in the first two films back in early 2000s. I too had to overcome, um, like Lara, um, um, and, you know, a lot of questioning, but, you know, it's, it's an adventure. Mm -hmm. And I, I was really intrigued to go on it. And um, it's a character that I, since I was a kid, um, kind of meant a lot because I had never seen a female protagonist in a video game back then. Angelina Jolie kind of showed me a heroine up on screen like that, which I hadn't seen. And uh, so it felt like a like an honor, you know, getting the chance to, you know, throw yourself out in a film like this. But filming the movie was no easy ride for the Oscar winning actor. I mean, your body hurts constantly. Um, and then, but then it was interesting because I thought the most difficult part was going to be, you know, be pulled up in those wires or uh, go all some fight sequences. So you got a lot of bruises and cuts everywhere. But actually, it was the water sequences that was the absolute worst because your body temperature was just so low and it was such cold water. And that's like a bad migraine or, you know, toothache. It's like you can't really, like, you know, trying to step out of it, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, But then it helps that you hear the word action, which is kind of the magic word for a bit, big push of adrenaline, I guess. <laughs> Vikanda hopes their hard work will pay off and fans will be thrilled with the result. Promise me you will stop them. I think the mix of wanting to honour the fans, of bringing them, you know, this character that they have cherished and followed for such a long time, and yet kind of with the other uh, cast and the filmmaker and producers also, uh, dare to, to, to push it and hopefully give them something fresh and new that they haven't seen before. Well, that's it on our show for today. Head to our YouTube channel for more from the world of arts and culture. But before we leave, let's first go to Sydney, Australia, where artist and activist Ai Weiwei has unveiled a massive installation that is meant to call the world's attention to one of the biggest crises facing humanity today. I'm Efnan Hun. Thanks for joining us. Bye for now.
I would do anything for those people who is unfortunate, lost their voice, never had a chance to look at the sky again, not have possibility to feel the ocean again.、Mm-hmm.